and welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. My guest today is the novelist, the essayist, Gore Vidal. But this time it's the essayist. It's his book called At Home, 1982-1988, Essays as if he were writing to his late grandfather. It's published by Random House, and you feel as if you are the only one he is talking to when you read the book. We will be back after a short pause with Gore Vidal. Welcome back. We're talking with Gore Vidal, author of Essays, 1982-1988, At Home, published by Random House. Welcome, Gore. Nice to see you again, Connie. Thank you, Gore. It is a pleasure to see you. And reading this book, I felt it was as if you were writing each essay for your late grandfather, the blind Senator Gore, that in writing to him, it would be read aloud, and yet he, you were keeping up to his standards for what? Gore Vidal, the autodidact. Well, also, Gore Vidal, reading to my grandfather, was keep it short, as he was blind from the age of 10, and I had to read to him. And uh, being blind, everything took so long, and he liked only to be read to. I had to know when to skip the dull parts. And I started learning that at six and seven. It's been very useful over the years. Fascinating in the book, because 82 to 88, when it begins with covering Richard Nixon, whom you claim you invented in The Best Man's Best Man. That's it, yes. That almost the monster you created becomes a monster on its own. Exactly, yes. I always felt that I'd done so much about Nixon, and I also created, uh, I'm in the Baron Frankenstein business, I've created two monsters. I think I created uh, Nixon, and I know that I created Ronald Reagan, who would not have been president if it hadn't been for me. In 1959, in order to help my friend Jack Kennedy become president, I wrote a play for Broadway called The Best Man. It's about two men in contention at a uh, convention for the presidency in the near future. One was a sort of Stevensonian type, and one was uh, somebody like Richard the Black-Hearted, as Jack Kennedy always called Nixon. Mm -hmm. So this play ran for a couple of years, was a movie and so on, and it was my Nixon. I also did an evening with Richard Nixon for Broadway, but nobody came because nobody wanted to spend an evening with Richard Nixon. I hadn't figured that that was a downer. But Ronald Reagan, in 59, his agents at MCA proposed that he be cast in the lead of my play, The Best Man. And I said, no, he's a charming actor, but I said he'd be totally unbelievable as a candidate for president. So I cast Melvin Douglas in the play and Henry Font in the movie. Ronald Reagan, at a very loose end, has nothing left to do anymore, having lost Death Valley days. So he goes on to be governor of California. And the essay in the book entitled Ronnie and Nancy is written in 1983. And you talk about what you've just mentioned, but you bring it up and you say he could even run and be reelected. Yes, well, he ran and he was reelected, to my surprise. But this is a TV age, and although he's no more than, I call him the acting president, he has been hired to give a performance as president of the United States. He's not the president. He fulfills none, actually nothing but the ceremonial end. He has no interest in politics, no interest in the country. But he's very good at reading these lines, so he has done his work as an actor. Actually, he was hired by the people who gave him the money t to go into politics, cut the taxes of the rich, cut corporate taxes, and get all the money to the Defense Department, which in turn pays for the politicians, including the presidents, including himself. He did all that, and now we're $2 trillion in debt, and we're in great trouble. Yes, and we don't even have really very good uh, space shuttles to show for it. We have nothing to show for it except an educational system that has collapsed. You know, I saw Johnny Carson the other day, and I did the program. Before we went on, he wouldn't talk about it on air. 90% of the American people think the sun goes around the Earth. Yeah. Uh, it, it is shocking. And again, in the essay in this book on Italo, 
Calvino. Mm -hmm. It is, a, by the way, that is a magnificent essay. But it is the role of the writer in Italy as opposed to the educated American and their concept of the writer. And you carry through his funeral and the whole sort of uh, a man being paid his homage, mm -hmm. his due. Well, a writer in Italy or any of the civilized countries from which I'm afraid we have to exclude, and I say this very sadly, our own country, we've never achieved a civilization. We have had brilliant writers, but uh, literature means nothing to Americans, and it's partly due to the um, educational system. A writer is a form of entertainer and a very low-ranking one. He's far behind basketball players or uh, talk show hosts or anything else. In serious countries, the writer is the one person, he's sort of like a shaman. He's like a witch doctor, he's like a seer, he's a magician, a warlock. He's the one who sees the future. He's the one who defines the prospect. He gives you the terminology. Yeah. Here, writers are only good, well, did uh, Ernest Hemingway knock John Steinbeck down? Yeah. Or what does Gore Vidal really think of Norman Mailer? That's all they can do is gossip. But Gore Vidal, in some ways, has been Savannah Rolla to the United States of America. Gore, we're going to take a short pause. When we come back, we're talking writers do. What will be the assessment if you were writing about Gore Vidal instead of Calvino? We'll be back after a short pause with Gore Vidal, author of At Home, Essays 1982-1988, published by Random House. Welcome back. We're talking with Gore Vidal, author of At Home, published by Random House. Uh, Gore, before the break, Calvino, and I said, how do you feel you would be written about if you were writing about Gore Vidal, per se, in that case? Well, I wouldn't be writing about me, uh, even if I were in such an extraordinary situation as to attend my own funeral, as I attended Calvino's funeral. I'm not my own subject. And I've never interested myself very much, which is why I'm the least autobiographical of American writers. There are two kinds of writers, you know, maybe two kinds of people. There are those who are interested in things outside themselves, and they are interested in windows, looking out from the self at other things. And then there are the romantics, the memoirists, who don't want windows, they want mirrors. That was your friend Anais Nin. Anais was a yeah. very good example of somebody who could not write about anything but Anais, a subject of some interest to a point, and after that, somewhat uh, limited. Uh, most American writers tend to write about themselves. I think a lot of it has to do with what we were talking about earlier, that the American culture has no interest in writers at all. In fact, our reading skills as a country are less and less, thanks to our educational system. So people just don't read seriously at all anyway. So how would they know if a great writer came along, if we had a Tolstoy, say, or even if we had a Calvino? There's nobody out there to respond. Our educational system, I often think of it as a removing the receptors from the children's brains. Everybody's got this receptor for receiving information. The schools go to work to undo everything so that nothing can come in except TV commercials to make sure that the people of the country are docile workers and enthusiastic consumers. If the people were not totally ignorant of their own interests, their history, who we are, where we are, they would never vote for Ronald Reagan. They would never have an election like this thing between Dukakis and Bush. Apropos of that, <laughs> you know, in the book again, you're writing about, referring to your book on Lincoln. And I thought it was rather interesting, sort of ombrage and uh, an attitude about some of the critics who were, as you feel, fallacious or out to get you. But remembering the book and the relationship between Lincoln and Chase, I kept thinking, it's Bush and Dole. <laughs> it is a, history is repeating itself in a sense with Dole and Bush and how Bush is going to handle Dole. I think it's going to be as tense as uh, 
Lincoln and his Secretary of the Treasury, who was always undercutting him. But where Lincoln was a wartime president and the recreator of the United States, and the United States was on a great rise in the world, we were coming into our own as the first modern nation, and Lincoln was our founder. Bush comes at the end of the United States as a world power, and our economic uh, hegemony of the earth is finished for five years now, ever since the money capital went from New York to Tokyo. So you're going to see, I think, with Bush, and this, you're going to see the nakedness of our political system that we don't have one. I don't think that the president will have much to say about the economy, which is all that matters. I think it's going to be taken out of his hands. By who? Multi, multi national uh, cartels of different sorts will probably save us, wicked as they are, it's the ITTs of the world, who are truly universal and truly don't want wars and don't want money wasted on defense in any country. The downside is they don't pay taxes, but the upside is they don't let countries go to war. The United States has been dying for a war, our, our rulers, the people. We, we're sensible, we don't want one. But every president from uh, Harry Truman on including the revered Jack Kennedy, who invades Cuba and uh, heats up the war in Vietnam. They all want wars to justify the military budget. All of this spending on war has bankrupted us, and the result is that we no longer have an educational system. We have more poverty than you can see in one end of the first world to the other. There is no poverty anywhere. I live south of Naples, and I also live in Los Angeles. There is no poverty anywhere in Naples to equal what's going on in East Los Angeles. This country's a scandal. And it is because all the money went to defense and for wars. Well, war, though, is also a means of alleviating unemployment in the minority and the young. No, it's not. Uh, war is what they call uh, money intensive, but it is not people intensive. In other words, it, very few people are hired by Boeing Northrop, Lockheed, who are the great beneficiaries of the Pentagon's mad spending, they don't hire that many people. It's in other industries and services that the people at large uh, receive income. But you draft people, young people, into an army and you send them off to fight and you still are using foot soldiers, therefore you don't have to worry about an unemployment problem. Well, Barbara I don't. I, Ward I, no. once talked about this, that America never knew how to live with a peacetime economy. Well, we used to do very well with the peacetime economy, and certainly in the 20s, certainly the great period uh, for the United States was 1898, right up to 29, and that was a long period of great prosperity. We were famous for making things. The business of America is business, said Warren G. Harding. Well, he wasn't a fool. That was our business. We are not suited to be the policemen of the world, and everybody hates us for having tried it. Now we're going to have to pull back and repair our society and be more modest. Ah, uh, Gore. And as you said, you have, I, I asked you earlier about living in Rome with the American dollar, uh, where when you went there six years ago you were a king, and today you have to be a pauper if you have the American dollar overseas. Well, it's been, uh, the, the decline of the dollar has, has actually has been the mirror of the decline of the United States as a world power. We have dropped, we're number 24 in quality of life. Uh, Denmark is number one. Italy, curiously enough, is number two. Uh, readers, we're number 24. I mean, we have just dropped, dropped, dropped economically. Forget it. We're, we're out of the running. So American abroad is no longer the king that he was when I was, uh, when I got out of the army in 1946 and headed straight for Europe. I think I lived on $3,000 a year and uh, in luxury. Yeah. Those days are gone. Gore, we're going to take a short pause. When we come back, because of the time of year we are speaking, I would like to know, do you still hold Jack Kennedy in the concept of a friend? We'll be back with Gore Vidal, author of At Home, Essays 1982-1988, published by Random House.
Welcome back. We're talking with Gore Vidal, At Home, Essays 1982-88. to 88. Before the break, I asked you about Jack Kennedy, and it follows in that essay on national security. Well, I've certainly been thinking a lot about Jack Kennedy, as you cannot switch the dial without yet another memorial to him. He was certainly one of the greatest charmers I've ever known. He was the greatest gossip. He could tell you who was in bed with whom anywhere on earth. I think you must have the entire CIA and FBI working yeah. on that. He was a great gossip. Shrewd, he had, a, he had a good temperament for a president. He was rather balanced most of the time. But he was a war lover. Uh, he thought he loved counterinsurgency, he loved spies, he loved the Pentagon until the Pentagon betrayed him over the bill of of the Bay of Pigs. All in all, um, I think his presidency was a catastrophe. And the Kennedy loyalists now tell us had he only lived, he wouldn't mm -hmm. have gone into further into Vietnam the way Johnson did. I don't believe a word of it. We were geared up to go in to justify his inaugural speech. We will bear any burden. Uh, that meant he declared war on the rest of the world. The United States will be in any country on earth. Now, what the hell we're doing in Angola, where we have no interest, what we're doing in Vietnam, where we have no interest, except to contain China, which A, we couldn't contain, and China's worst enemies are the Vietnamese. So we should have been supporting them against China if we were serious and said we went to war with Vietnam. Nothing too stupid could be done, and a lot of it is traceable to him. Again, I have to piggyback to the book on Richard Nixon, because you do give him the credit that as the wicked Richard the Lionhearted or the Blackhearted, he still is the man who made the overtures to China and to Russia. Oh, Nixon, you know, is a pretty bad hat from the word go, but he is intelligent. And he is us, as you said. And he is us. I mean, you cannot say, oh, Nixon is an aberration, one bad apple in a splendid barrel which contains us all, nonsense. He was elected president not once, but twice. Nixon is us, and we are Nixon. And his bad side is the bad side of Americans, who will sell you a lousy car, you know, knowing it's lousy and it breaks down. He's the realtor who's always selling, you know, shady acres, which turns out to be, you know, four feet underwater someplace. Yeah. But the guy is shrewd, which is, the American people are not stupid. They knew what they were doing. They thought, well, he is a crook, but he's bright, you he's know, and crook. it's a tough world. He's our crook. And he was okay for a while. He did two important things. He opened up China, got us into a normalized relations there, and uh, with the Soviet Union, he arranged a detente, which I think will eventually end up with some sort of an alliance, and he can be given credit for that. So of the president since Roosevelt, he's about the only one that I'd give a high mark to. Gore, are you our gadfly, and in that case, do you assign yourself the topic of the essays? Or is the, does the magazine come to you or the New York Book of Review, Review of Books come and say, Gore, have you considered writing about this? How do the essays germinate? It's both. Sometimes the New York Review will propose something and sometimes I propose something. They seem to evolve out of what one's interests are at the moment, if they were put in chronological order, you'd get a pretty good history of the times as, as I was mm -hmm. reacting to what was happening around me. Uh, it's both. There's input on both sides. I am very fortunate as an essayist in that uh, I don't do, do this for money. I only write about what interests me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am the envy of most journalists, you know, many of them can do what I do far better than I do, but they're under enormous pressure to turn out stuff for their publishers, and they mm -hmm. don't have the leisure. I can spend two, three months on a, a short piece. When you are spending that time, how much is the, the artistic critic within you rewriting, re, uh, rewording uh, a, a sentence? Oh, well, constantly. Yeah. It's usually just to cut the cackle, you know, you'll get straight to the point as quickly as possible. That takes a lot of rewriting. American speech is now, slightly due to television and due to the educational system, no one says anything anymore. I guess what I think that I really sort of maybe uh, believe, 
Everybody starts sentences like that for fear they might say something that is not generally accepted by everyone. If you know what I mean. If you know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Or, or, uh, all right? Okay? Mm -hmm. That's been added out here now, I noticed, in the last year. So I went to Ralph's, okay? Now I got out of the car, okay? Now this guy I came over, I used to know, okay? Well, <laughs> suddenly is now, these, these are all roadblocks. Words, this is the broadened irony that you are given credit. Yes, well, the irony yes. comes out, out of, being, of listening to others and repeating it. All right. Uh, there's a quote in the book, and I must ask about that. And that is the role of the liberal in the United States. I have just spoken with Howard Fast, and he said, if it were not for the liberal, we would not have Social Security, education, Medicare. The liberal has been given a bad name. You forget one important thing, the GI Bill of Rights, for which my generation, millions of people who would never have been near a school, a university, mm -hmm. got their chance through the liberal measure to give everybody who had served in the Second War a crack at going to a university which they would have in any civilized country in Western Europe or Japan, but they don't get here. These are all liberal measures, and the fact that the word was demonized in the election only shows that if people haven't been taught anything and they don't know the meaning of one word or another, you can demonize liberal. Mm -hmm. Next time, that might be George Washington. They'll prove that George Washington was anti-capitalist. So suddenly, he's a school of Washington. Oh, no, he's not. Yes, oh, yes, he is. He's a card-carrying Washingtonian. I didn't yeah. know. All you right. could do that so easily. Then, again, extending that a little further, in the book there is the story, too, of the Penn lectures, where you are there with Norman Mailer. So, I mean, there is already detente between the Mailer faction and the Vidal faction. That's Incidentally, Norman Mailer and I were uh, invited by Gorbachev to Moscow to the, two years ago to the plenum on uh, nuclear disarmament. And we were sitting side by side in the Great Hall of the Kremlin. I have Pierre Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, on my left. And suddenly this American very eagerly comes over and takes our picture and says, I guess it took detente to get you two guys together and vanished into the snows of the Kremlin. Yeah. But uh, there we were together as two pen men and two wielders of axes. For those who may not know, would you just define what PEN is? It is the Honorary Society for Writers. I don't even know what it stands for. What are the P-E-N? It's uh, Playwrights, Essayists, Novelists. Yes. It was founded about a hundred years ago by John Macefield. How do I remember these things? Around the, the beginning of this century, and uh, it's in every country. It does worthy things. Such like, as? Well, getting writers out of prison mm -hmm. in South America, Eastern Europe. Uh, it doesn't do much about writers in prison here, like Eldridge Cleaver, as uh, PEN respects the racism of the United States, but uh, it's fairly, you know, fairly noble in a kind of dull way. Forgive me, because now I have to ask you about a quote. And in, in asking you, I, an area I do not understand your position, and it comes to if one of the signs of obsession is an inability to tell the difference between what matters and what does not. For me, as I read your obsession about Israel. No. Okay. It's not Israel. I haven't any interest in Israel. One way or the other, I'm obsessed by the so-called neoconservatives in the United States. And what they have done, working hand in glove with the American-Israeli Political Action Committee, which is the Israel Lobby, as we sit here, it will be past news by the time people see this, they have single-handedly kept Arafat from addressing the United Nations. If that is not something to get the blood pressure going, I don't know what is. Anyone can speak to the United Nations. Whether you like Arafat or not isn't beside the point. He has now been accepted by most of the countries of the world. But he no. hasn't, he was instrumental in hostage-taking of Americans in Lebanon. The United States, first, we don't know that. Second, the United States is one of the leading terrorist countries in the world. When we were condemned for mining the harbors of Nicaragua, mm -hmm. Nicaragua wanted this to be adjudicated by the World Court at The Hague, and the United States said, we won't go. So much for the United States mm -hmm. as a terrorist country. Israel commits, commits acts of terrorism every day. But if you mention it, you're an anti-Semite. Or well, they start talking about the Holocaust, which is slightly irrelevant. 
The point is that we can no longer afford paying for the state of Israel. But well, we can no longer afford to pay for d uh, defense of Japan either, Gore. Well, uh, of course not. Um, yeah, and if we have to have a priority, because that's part of prioritizing, certainly there is more of a fidelity to an Israel, which is the only democratic, so, I mean, they're having Connie, a lot of problems, Connie, Gore. Connie. Now, but it's the only thing in the Middle East. Stop that. Now, everybody knows that isn't true. Is it democratic for the one and a half million Arabs living there who are now in they a state of rebellion? Vote. They have a vote. No, they don't. Not in the occupied lands. They certainly don't have the vote. Well, the occupied lands is... Well, it is know, not the a democracy, worst part Connie. is we have two minutes left, Gore, and I'm going to ask you to autograph my book and say, let's talk a little further <laughs> some other time. But I thank you for allowing me to read the book and to have the feeling as if you had written it as a letter to me. And it, next year, Connie, in Jerusalem. I, yes, <laughs> in March for the book fair. Uh, if you'd like a copy of our publication, Good Books, write to me, Connie Martinson, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California, 90069. Look for our column in Beverly Hills today, Palm Springs Day, all of the California Press Bureau newspapers. We'll tell you about some other books we've liked recently, especially Willard Bascom's book, The Crest of the Wave. He's an oceanographer. He is a man who has gone beneath the oceans to figure out the seismic waves. He has been in the atolls measuring the results of nuclear testing, and he discovered a Spanish galleon off Bahama. Well, the boat that he brought up and the gold that he discovered wasn't worth the trouble he went through with the Prime Minister of the Bahamas. So possibly it works in the fact of Americans not always, as Gore says, being welcome in Central America and other islands off Florida. Meanwhile, support your local library. Go in, take out a card. That is how they get funding. It's probably the most important institution in America. And look up some of Gore's other books, Lincoln, The Best Man, his essays, and even a beautiful picture book called Vidal on Venice. And support an organization called Riff Reading is Fundamental, which helps children learn to collect books. And maybe they will start to become readers in depth and they can answer Andre Gide's question, what do you Americans see in Henry James? And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Gore. <laughs>